All right, guys. So today we're going to utilize prior knowledge of literary time periods, isms, and settings to analyze the text, the sorrow of war, uh, to gain understanding of tone, mood, and in order to recognize the differences between the two and identify them within the book. Okay, but you guys only have about 18 pages of it, all right? So basically today I'm going to give you a quick lesson on tone versus mood. We're going to do a lesson on the sorrow of war. Tonight, you do need to complete your sor the summary of the Sorrow of War by 11.59, and then you need to complete the Nearpod by Friday. And also, when you come back on Thursday at the start of class, you need to have read all 18 pages. Yes. Yes. So, so basically, this is the summary quiz. It is going to be a summative grade. So, question. The question is, uh, you should have read up to at least page nine. Okay. No. You should have read up to page nine. Oh, thank you. All right. So you should have read to at least page nine. Therefore, you should be able to provide me a three to five sentence summary over the first nine pages. Now, I'm going to be very clear. Do not use spark notes or cliff notes. This has become a habit that I keep seeing. Here's some of the issues with that. One, do I make you read the whole book? No. No, but spark notes, those people read the whole book. Therefore, they provide summaries for the entire book and not over the sections that I've given you. Secondly, it's very clear when you guys use them because all of a sudden you start using words like inclination, assuage, all these like fancy words that I'm like, please. <laughs> uh, you can't even tell me what those mean. So, and then you literally copy it word for word, wow. right? And, it, and sometimes they'll even include the from SparkNotes. So <laughs> I need you to cut it out because I do read this these books more than you realize and so i know what is right and wrong with that and i know when you're talking about the entire book or whether you're talking about the sections i gave you okay so this is a summative grade it should be an easy a as long as you read it all right it is due at 11 59 this one i will not be reopening so you need to make sure to read those pages any questions by tonight because I gave you all Friday, I gave you all yesterday to read it. Okay, so a quick lesson on tone versus mood. I'm sure you've heard about tone and mood before, yes? Yes, ma'am. All right, so tone is basically the attitude or feeling the author has towards their work, okay? That's normally created through diction and details and can be is very often implied what is diction Word. words words their word usage okay and the, the details they provide and implied means i'm going to pick it up through it they're not going to just directly tell it to me right they're not going to be like this is how i feel about the vietnam war right they're going to kind of use their words and the imagery and things like that to help you mood on the other hand is what is inspired in you what you create what the book creates in you. How do you feel, right? So that is created through setting, imagery, and diction. And that one can be both direct and indirect. So when I say direct, they can say it was a scary woods, right? That's very direct, I should be afraid. To where if they're like, I was walking in the dark wood and I could hear these creepy noises and the trees were looking at, like hovering over me, that very much, <laughs> That very much is implied, right? I, I'm gonna get scared, but they're not telling me it's scary. Okay, does that make sense? So when we think about tone, remember tone is the author. Think back to the things they carry. What tone did O'Brien have? A subtle, okay, subtle. Right, there was no real emotion, right? What else? Any other ones that you can think of? Okay. So when we think back to O'Brien, we could say he's definitely non-judgmental, right? So everything that's going on, he never passes judgment, right? 
when they talk about the one guy that goes naked into the town and, and scares people, he never says, that's crazy, that's creepy, right? He literally is just like, this is what happened, yeah? Okay. And even when things happen and Lieutenant Cross is trying to judge himself, the narrator, the author, never passes judgment. So it's very really non-judgmental. He also has a familiar feeling with it, right? He knows these men, right? He's giving us intimate details. He's not saying exactly who they are, but he knows them well enough to provide information and to give us an inside view of each of them. And he's also very emotionless, right? When Lavender dies, when Kiowa dies, he's not like, oh my God, I'm torn up and oh my, no, he's just very, this is what happened, right? Lavender, shot in the head, boom down, Kiowa, blown up in the mud, that's what happened, right? So very emotionless. So that is basically the author's take on it. But what about the mood that he creates? What is the emotions that it inspired in you? Sadness. Sadness, okay. Fear. Fear, okay. Those are some good ones, yeah. So when we think about it, some of the most common ones, it's reflective, right? Because we see the soldiers kind of reflecting on their lives, right? especially when it comes to Lieutenant Cross. And by seeing that, that makes us feel reflective. What is he feeling? What is he thinking, right? Sadness. So even though O'Brien himself never comes out and says, I'm sad, and blah, 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 we actually feel that sadness, right? Through the, the way that they talk, he talks about the characters and how they die. There's also a sense of powerlessness, right? These men have no true power over what's happening to them. They're in war, whether they live or die is not even really up to them, right? They can do whatever they want to try to like push death away, but in reality, if death wants them, it's gonna get them, okay? So the, those are the differences. So I want you to make sure, tone is the author's emotions towards the book. Mood is your feelings towards the book, okay? Think about that as we start going through the Sorrow of War by Bao Nhi, okay? So now let's take a look at the actual text. And we are gonna be breaking this down. That's why I do wanna make sure that you have it read by Thursday, because we're gonna be breaking it down into pieces and discussing it, okay? So before we start the near pod, you're gonna pay close attention because you're gonna be required to repeat the information in your near pod because the Nearpod is gonna be for a grade. So then, virtual students, they do need to make sure to watch the, the video lecture, but you guys can also watch it as well if you need to be able to copy the stuff over. And then always make sure that you put your last name, first name, and then join and do all the activities because this will be for a grade. Okay, any questions? All right. So, The Sorrow of War by, by Bao Nin. So, first and foremost, you need to understand that this is a postmodern text. Why is it considered postmodern? So it takes place in the Vietnam War, which is a historical period, right? Yes. That is one of the, the characteristics of postmodern, right? Yes. Does it sugarcoat anything? No. no. It's a very graphic novel, right? Like it, it's very detailed. So there's that, there's definitely a hint of realism. So just like the uh, things they carry, this is postmodern and a realism book, okay? Mm -hmm. The difference is, this is by a Vietnamese author. He was a Vietnamese soldier. What you do need to understand when we, remember when we talked about all those periods and liter, literary periods? A lot of those periods included uh, texts from European countries, right? Mm -hmm. Your Greek, your French, English, right, British and then also some Americans. Asian literature is often left off of those periods, okay? They're not often mentioned. However, they have some really powerful novels, right? The difference between this type of literature and other literature is Asian literature tends to have a darker component to it, right? And there's also normally a sense of like supernatural in it because they, they have a very different take on spirituality, okay? So that's just something to keep in mind as we're reading it. So this is, so the things they carried was the American version, and now we're gonna look at a Vietnamese version, okay? Any questions? 
All right. So this is actually a picture of around the area that he's going to be describing and talking about. This is part of Vietnam, and it's near the place that he's talking about. Okay. So this is just so you have it in your mind's eye what the setting kind of looks like. What are some thoughts that come to mind? A lot of trees, a lot of buildings. A lot of trees. Empty. empty, like there's a the empty pack behind it. Mm -hmm. What about like when we look over here? Oh, foggy. foggy. And what what does that what so, sense does that create? Oh, yeah. Ominous hiding, right? It's almost like a mystical feel of it, right? Does it look very bright and sunny and like I'm gonna go like skipping down the <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <clears throat> so just keep that in mind. So let's start off with what we do know. What is the setting for this book? <clears throat> so Vietnam. But there's a specific place in Vietnam. Do you remember? China. Huh? <clears throat> it's on one of the rivers, but there's a specific jungle. Yeah, okay, so we're, we're going to find out. And do you remember what years or years? 1975. Mm, close. 1968. <laughs> Both of you are close. So let's find out, okay? But right. Both of you guys are close. Wait, we have it or we have You and Evans. Okay. So. Setting A, we'll, we'll say A, okay, because there's two different settings. Setting A, on the banks of the Yom Krong Poco River, on the northern flank of the B3 battlefield in the central highlands, the missing in action remains gathering team who awaits the dry season of 1975. The mountains and jungles are water soaked and dull. Wet trees, quiet jungles, all day and all night the water streams. A sea of greenish vapor over the jungle's carpet of rotting leaves. September and October drive by, then November passes, but still the weather is unpredictable and the night rains are relentless. Sunny days, but rainy nights. Even in early December, weeks after the end of the normal raining season, rainy season, the jungles this year are still as muddy as all hell. They are forgotten by peace, damaged and impassable. All the tracks disappeared bit by bit, day by day into the embrace of a coarse undergrowth and wild grasses. Traveling in such conditions is brutally tough. To get from Crocodile Lake east of Solitary River across District 67 to the crossroads of Cross Hill on the west bank of the Yaw Tron Poco, a mere 50 kilometers, the powerful Russian truck has to lumber along all day. <coughs> As they, and they still fall short of their destination. Not until after dusk does the MIA Zill truck reach the jungle of screaming souls where they park beside a wide creek clogged with rotting branches. So what's their destination? Mm, no, they cross it. Where, where's their final destination that they're trying to get to? The jungle of screaming souls. Doesn't that sound your buddy? No. <laughs> the jungle of screaming souls. So we have the jungle of screaming souls. And apparently this is a real place. It's been turned into a national park. That's not a park. Okay. That, that sounds very fun. Yeah. What and it's actually it? near this crocodile lake. And when I looked it up, apparently when they say crocodile lake, they mean crocodile lake. Like there's okay. nothing but crocodiles in there. Then what's the point? So does it does it sound like a very safe inviting place? No. No. Oh, if you sip in the water. <laughs> so what year are we in? Huh? Is it 1975? Yeah. Oh, wait. The dry season of 1975. 1974. Oh, 1974. 1974. And we know this because he says September, October, November passes, and even into early December. So we're not just in 1974. We're in what part of the year? Um, like, like fall and winter, right? Yeah. So we're fall and winter. And it's called the wet season, right? The, the wet or rainy season. And he says everything is wet, right? Everything. Can you imagine it raining every single day? Yes. yes. Every day for that long. Oh, for that long. Mm -hmm. What's his job? 
What's the person's job? Whoever's narrating it. I can't see. To give on images. The missing in action remains gathering team. Oh, he gets the bodies? They get the bodies. Oh, that sucks. Okay, so that is their job. But it's 1974. So that's a little bit after the Americans leave, right? But they're still looking for bodies at this point. And so what are some literary devices we see in here? So definitely imagery, right? Imagery. All day, all night. Right. Huh? Yeah, day by day, bit by bit. Right. So it, it creates that sense of just reoccurring over and over. Right. So it's reoccurring. Nothing's changing, right? And then he uses terms like water soul, dull. Right? Then he uses, where is it? Muddy. Rotty. So what sense does that create for you? Just hmm? Yeah. And it's definitely not an easy, an easy go, right? It's not like they're just driving down the freeway and I'm gonna get where I'm going. It's the idea that they're they're battling against all of this. They're battling against nature uh, to get where they're supposed to be going. So the conflict could be versus nature? Yeah, conflict could definitely, yes, I like that. Conflict would definitely be <clears throat> character versus nature, right? Yes. Because it even says it's only 50 kilometers. Now, we're in the US, we use miles, don't know how far 50 kilometers, but it makes it sound like that shouldn't take all day. But it not only takes all day, but they don't get there until dusk. Okay, so it takes them a long time. And then even here again, it says clogged with rotting branches. So when they get where they're supposed to be going, it's still nature's just, and it's not even nature in its prime, it's nature like it's dying, right? Any questions? Okay, so we're gonna keep this part on the side. As you should. As I should. They said 50. Okay. Okay. Now let's take a look at setting B. Setting B. Okay. Kind knows the area well. It was here at the end of the dry season in 1969. That his 27th battalion was surrounded and almost totally wiped out. Ten men survived from the lost battalion after fierce, horrible, barbarous fighting. That was the dry season when the sun burned harshly, the wind blew fiercely, and the enemy set napalm spraying through the jungles and a sea of fire enveloped everything, spreading like the fires of hell. Troops and fragmented companies tried to regroup, only to be blown out of their shelters again as they went mad, became disoriented, and threw themselves into nets of bullets dying in flaming inferno. Above them, the helicopters flew at treetop height and shot them almost one by one, the blood spraying out, spraying from their backs, flowing like red mud. The, red, the diamond-shaped grass clearing was piled high with bodies killed by helicopter blood ships. Broken bodies, bodies blown apart, bodies vaporized. No jungle grew again in this clearing, no grass, no plants. Jeez. So, what is setting B? The dry season of 1969. Do we remember what was going on in 1969? The movement. The actual war. But it was the most bloodiest part of the war because that is literally when the Americans sent a um, huge number of troops into it, right? So this is in the midst of battle, and this is actually a battle that they come across, right? So we definitely know that it's the dry season. And when do we think the dry season is? Summer, right? Or we definitely know it's before and after winter. So we can think summer because of the way he talks about the sun, right? The sun burst, burned harshly and the wind blew fiercely. Does that sound any better than the rainy season? Yes. I mean, I mean, no. Does it? 
You're in the hot sun. I want to take the green and take that from the first. Okay. Okay. So it, it seems a little bit better. At least you're not trudging through stuff, right? Wait, the hot sun better? That's it. The hot sun's better. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to take the now, what is his job? What is he? So in 1974, we know he's collecting bodies, right? Mm -hmm. What is he doing in 69? He's a, he's a finder. For what? The 27th Battalion. The 27th Battalion. <clears throat> How many people are left after this? Only 10. So that means that Kine is one of 10, right? Because if only 10 people survive and he's, he's telling you the story, he survived it. Yes? So Kine is one. And they call it the Lost Battalion. Why do you think that? Because a lot of people died. A lot of people died, right? So, what are some literary devices in here? Imagery. Definitely imagery, right? Broken body, body falling apart. Body yeah. Making. The repetition of bodies, 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 right? Bodies killed. What is body standing for? Dead body, body. people, dead people. Not just dead people, but dead. Wow. Dead soldiers. Does he specify what soldiers? No. No. So it could be American, it could be Vietnamese, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. So these are very graphic. <laughs> really? I'm gonna tell. <laughs> okay, what about a sea of fire? And then spreading like the hells of fire, what is that? It's really hot. No, no, it's about the napalm. Yeah. Similarly, do you guys remember what napalm is? Yeah. You do? What is it? It's like, um, no, like a blank carries a, a series of bombs and just drop them down and Okay, so that's not necessarily napalm, but they used to do that too. So a napalm is actually a chemical that they spray on you and then they set it on fire and you cannot put it out no matter what. It literally will burn you alive. Wait, what it about in the water? It does not matter. It does not come off. And oh, it's a horrible death. Scary. It wow. is literally a horrible and they would just spray everything. Is that illegal now? Yes. That's illegal. Wow. It's considered kind of like a war crime, yeah. Wow. So, but basically they'd spray everything in their path. And then they got, have a guy and go set everything on fire. What is it called? Napalm. 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 Mm -hmm. There's actual videos of what it actually does. Okay. Not right now, no. Okay. <laughs> nets of bullets. What does this indicate? What? Threw themselves into nets of bullets. They just gave it into a line of fire. Yeah, like, but it's not just a couple of bullets, right? It's a whole, a whole field of it, right? Then it says, above them, helicopters flew at the treetop height and shot them one by one. Do these guys stand a chance? Napalm is an airplane. So there's no chance. Okay. Then it says, the diamond-shaped grass clearing was piled high with bodies killed by the helicopter gunships. No jungle grew again in this clearing. No grass, no plants. What does that tell me? What is that trying to indicate? It, that battle destroyed everything, yeah. right? It's almost like a scar on the land, right? And it's diamond shaped. And it also tells you that this was a clearing, which means there was trees around it, but the actual place that they were fighting was wide open. Is that a good place to be in war? No. No, right? Because we've also seen this before and the things they carried. Were they not in a clearing when Kyle would die? No, they were in a clearing. It was like a it was like a ditch that was there was nothing, there was no trees. There was nothing to cover them, right? The same thing when Lavender dies, they're in an opening. I mean, but he was it doesn't matter, he was in the open. <laughs> so these these men have nothing to hide them. So they're all out in the open. So if we have a little war, we know that we need to be near trees, right? Kind of keep a covering. But it very much is like a scar on the land. Okay, so it's not just a scar in his memory, it's also on the land. Any questions? No, no. So now we know 
we know the two settings, right? Mm -hmm. We know that it, it takes place yeah. in, jungle screaming souls. in the jungle screaming souls, which is the setting for both of them. It's the place mm -hmm. of both both times, but it's in. 1974? 1969. 1969. So if we think about conflict, which conflict is going on here? Character versus characters. Character versus characters. Because they kill each other. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. Definitely. But he's very much using imagery, right? Yes. Okay. So here's my question. We have 1974 and 1969. Is this a linear or nonlinear plot? Nonlinear non because it's jumping back and forth. There's flashbacks or memories, right? So, a question I didn't ask the other students though. So, so far, who is the narrator? Uh, or what point of view is this? We don't, it's not kind though, is it? Because it actually says Kind's name over and over again. It's third person limited, right? Okay, so it's third person limited because we go into Kind's head, but we go into Kind's head, but that's the only person's head we go into, right? And but it also names Kind by name, right? So we have that outside narrator that's just going into his dreams and things, okay? So now we know that the setting is the Jungle Screaming Souls. We know it's the wet season and dry season, which is kind of interesting, right? We call this juxtaposition when you have two opposites that are next to each other, right? So two di very different fields. Any questions? All right. So now let's go ahead and talk about Oh, and this is going to be the quiz that you do have to answer, and you just answered it. Because it asks what kind of plot it is. So that should be an easy 100. So tone and mood. I'm going to read you two passages. One from each setting, okay? Each time period. And I want you to think about the tone. Remember, tone is how the author feels, and the mood is how it makes you feel, okay? So let's do this. All right, from 1974. So this is after the war, right? The driver stays in the cab and goes straight to sleep. Kind climbs warily in the rear of the truck to sleep alone in a hammock strung high from cab to tailgate. At midnight, the rain starts again. This time a smooth drizzle falling silently. The old terrapin covers the truck, is torn full of holes, letting the water drip, drip, drip through onto those plastic sheets covering the remains of soldiers laid out in rows below Kine's hammock. The human atmosphere condenses, its long, moist, chilly fingers sliding in and around the hammock where Kine lies shivering, half awake, half asleep, as though drifting along a stream. He is floating, sadly, endlessly, sometimes as if on a truck driving silent, silently, robot-like, salmonum bluntly, don't know how to say that, through the lonely jungle tracks, the stream moans, a desperate co uh, complaint, mixing with distant faint jungle sounds like an echo from another world. The eerie sounds come from somewhere in a remote past, arriving slow, softly like featherweight leaves falling on grass of times long, long ago. So, first of all, this word, I don't know how to pronounce it, but that means to sleepwalk. Okay. So, what are some literary devices first? Repetition, what? Okay, so that's repetition and that's also what? Um, it's making a sound. Onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia. Okay, okay, so yes, definitely onomatopoeia. What else? Definitely using figurative language, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of imagery. It's almost like you're there, right? <clears throat> Okay. It's long, moist, chilly fingers sliding in. He's talking about humidity, right? What is that literary device? Humidity? Oh. He's talking about humidity that has long, moist, chilly fingers. Oh, personification. Yeah. Personification. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, as though drifting along on a stream. Metaphor. Metaphor. <laughs> Okay. There's definitely lots of diction in here, right? Word choices. Okay. Then it says the stream moans a desperate complaint, mixing with distant faint jungle sound. What is that? That is also personification. Okay. Where? Oh yeah. Yes, simile. Okay. So what, okay. So first of all, let's look at this. The driver stays in the cab and goes straight to sleep. What do you, what do you get from that? What can you infer? He's tired. He's tired? Is this atmosphere bothering you? No. So he's not bothered. So this is definitely a juxtaposition, right? Yes. Because you have the driver next to kind, right? You have the driver next to kind, and the driver is just like, I'm out, I'm tired, Boop, right? To where kind stays awake and he goes through all of this emotion, right? He's awake at midnight. So obviously, he's not going to sleep. Also, what's underneath him? Body. In plastic sheets, right? The remains of soldiers from a battle that he fought in, right? But does he seem to be bothered by that? No. He's, no, he actually, he he's not really indicating that he's bothered by it, right? Yeah. What does that remind you of from a thing they carried? What, how did they treat death? Like it was nothing. Like it was nothing. Like it was nothing. They kept it at a distance. Kind's doing the same thing, isn't he? Right. There is some dudes underneath me. All right, I'm just gonna go. So time distance himself from death. Because could you do that? No. Yeah. So let's think about it. Not only is he is he laying over dead bodies, but he's laying over dead bodies in the middle of the night when it's raining in a place called the jungle of screaming souls. <laughs> Absolutely not, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. So let's look at tone first. What is the author's tone? Uncaring. So uncaring. Distant? Yes. Okay. Kind of just factual, huh? Right? I'm just gonna tell it to you like it is, right? <laughs> what is the mood it creates? So how does it make you feel? Okay, creepy, eerie. Depressing. Definitely depressing, right? Yes. Because if you, to me, I also felt suffocating. Because when he talks about that the human atmosphere is condensing, it's closing in on him. It's kind of, and then it's talking about creepy fingers. So it's almost like being strangled, right? He's just, well, everything around him is kind of coming in. And he's half awake, half asleep. Have you guys ever been that way? Yeah. Half asleep. Half awake, half asleep. Yeah. You can hear things going on, but you're kind of awake. Yeah. And it, but then you really have no controls. But he's hearing all these things, right? The jungle sounds, right? The eerie sounds from the remote past. So it's almost like we're getting ready to be transported someplace, right? It's setting us up for what? What do you think it's setting us up for? A dream or a flashback, right? We're going from the real world into his head. Right, we're transitioning. So I also felt like it was a very suffocating. Right, you can't, you can't breathe. You can't panic almost, right? Because do you think he wants to go back into his dreams? No. No. Okay. Any questions about this one? No. All right. So we had 1974. Obviously, he's doing his job, right? He's collected bodies. So now. Let's look at 1969. Nice. And let's see how you guys feel with that one. Okay? And I'm going to fill those in for you guys so that you'll have them. 
1969. Better to die than surrender, my brothers. Better to die, the battalion commander yelled insanely. Waving his pistol in front of Kine, he blew his own brains out through his ear. Kine screamed soundlessly in his throat at the sight as the Americans attacked with some machine guns, sending bullets buzzing like deadly bees around him. Then Kine lowered his machine gun, grasped his side, and fell, rolling slowly down the bank of a shallow stream, hot blood trailing down the slope after him. In the days that followed, crows and eagles darkened the sky. After the Americans withdrew, the rainy season came, flooding the jungle floor, turning the battlefield into a marsh whose surface water turned rust color from the blood. Bloated body, blo bloated human corpses, floating alongside with bodies of incinerated jungle animals mixed with branches and trunks cut down by the artillery, all drifting in a stinky marsh. When the flood receded, everything dried in the heat of the sun into thick mud and stinky, rotting meat. After that battle, no one mentioned the 27th Battalion anymore. The numerous souls of ghosts and devils were born in that de deadly defeat. They were still loose, wandering in every corner and brush in the jungle, drifting along the stream, refusing to depart from the other world. Okay, so. That, the first, the very first thing that happened, what? <clears throat> Did he actually just shoot himself in front of him? Yeah, so let's talk about that. He tells them, better to die than surrender, my brothers, better to die. And then he kills himself. What do you think about that? That's a coward's way out. So it's a coward's way, and it, yeah, he's hopeless, right? But is it, a lot of people would say that suicide is actually the ultimate surrender. So it's kind of hypocritical, right? That's also considered irony. What kind of irony would it be? Situational, dramatic. 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 No, because dramatic is I know something you don't know. Oh, situational. Situational is I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't. You just said it so <laughs> calmly. <soon. laughs> situational irony. <laughs> but let's think about it. he's the commander, the battalion commander, and he's just killed himself. Yeah, that's the challenge they have. Yeah, so how do you think his men feel? Betrayed, I would. I How would do you think Kind feels? He does it in front of Kind. Oh, he's yeah, he's shook it. Yeah, oh, he he shook. Shook. Wait, that's just another body. Yeah. What? So, well, how I, you, you could say shook. that, right? Because Kind and the narrator actually describe it very calmly and coolly, right? Yeah. He just shoots himself and Kind's like, up, oh, right? But then it says Kind screams soundlessly in his throat. What does that indicate? That he's eternally screaming. <laughs> He's, He's speechless. It the, it's almost like it's too much. Have you ever felt that way where like you try to say something and it gets caught because it's almost like it's too much for you to bear? So it's that idea. It's too much. He's in the middle of this battle. And how is this battle going? Bad. Bad, right? They were attacked with submachine guns, sending bullets buzzing like deadly bees around him. What is that? It's not personification. It's a... Simile, because we use like, but think about when bees swarm. Is there any real direction? No, they just go in. No, so it's the idea that there's so many bullets that are just everywhere, right? Everywhere, no direction. Then it says he lowers his machine gun and grasps his side, fell rolling down the bank of the shallow stream, hot blood trailing down the slope after him. Do we really think he got shot? Yeah. Mm, no. What do you guys think? Do you think he got shot? No. He pretended. You think he pretended? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Because that's what I thought too. When I read it, I was like, did he really get shot though? Like, or did he just fake it to get out of this chaos? Right? So we are left wondering if it's real. Right? Because it says hot blood trailing down the slope after him. But does it say? It doesn't say his hot blood, it could have been right? Blood. It could have been anybody's, right? Because down here, we find out that there's so much blood and bodies that when it floods, the water is red, right? Oh, Jesus. That is okay? Scary. What does it mean when he says, what, what can we infer from crows and eagles dark in the sky? A lot of the eagles are eating the bodies. Yeah, they're eating the dead, right? They got some eagles. And it's not just a little bit. It's a lot. It darkened the sky. It was almost like a swarm of cloud, right? Have you seen that in the sky? Uh, like a lot of woods. Mm -hmm. So, 
We know that the Americans withdrew, but did they take everything with them? Was the no. chaos gone with them? No. Mm -hmm. The aftermath is left, but then it brings up the rainy season. What do you think about that? It's like tears. Some, yeah, some people said it was like tears, right? Other people think of rain as cleansing, right? So it's trying to cleanse the earth, but is it able to cleanse it? No. No, right? It just kind of mashes it all together, and then it hardens in this one spot. And now, and we also know that nothing ever grows in this area again, right? Okay. What about this one? The bloated human corpses floating alongside the bodies of incinerated jungle animals mixed with branches and trunks. What, what does that tell us? Loaded human corpses floating alongside incinerated jungle anim animals mixed with branches and trunks, cut down by the artil artillery. It sounds like everything they did just went to one place. Yeah, everything was devastated, right? Yes. Nothing escaped. So everything died, right? Humans, animals, trees, everything. Devastated, just wiped out, right? And then it all gets left there. So the, the rain didn't clean it. It's all just meshed together. And like I said, thick mud, stinking, rotting mud. And when we think of this mud, think back to the things they carry. Okay, and they talked about Kiowa trying to get him out of the mud. It's not just any type of mud, right? It's that mud that's so thick that they couldn't get him out, right? So that's the type of mud it is. Now, Let's talk about this. Before we talk about this last section, I do want you to know that in many Asian cultures, they believe that you have two souls. Yes. You have a heavy soul and a light soul. The light soul is free to wander the world when you're alive, right? When you dream, it goes other places. Has, have you ever had a dream where somebody that you love visits you or you're talking to somebody that you love? The idea is that their soul is talking to you, right? Like they, They've come to visit you. Now, when you die, both of your souls are supposed to go up, right? They're supposed to go. But sometimes it doesn't work that way. There's certain, like, rituals you're supposed to follow and procedures to make sure that the heavy soul goes with the light soul up into heaven. And then the way the Asians believe is there's not that severe divide. They are very spiritual, and they believe that souls can come back. Spirits can come back and interact with the living. They can help them. They can curse them. They can hurt them right? They, they have a lot of ancestor worship because you're supposed to remember your dead. Kind of like in Coco. Have you ever seen Coco? Uh, yes. Okay. The, the Asian cultures tend to believe that as well. They put up these pictures, they burn incense, they have altars to make sure that the spirits know that they're still in connection with them. Okay. So it says after the battle, no one mentioned 27 battalion anymore. Why do you think that is? Because there's no corner, they're all dead. They're all dead, right? But if they're all dead, I mean, everybody died at the Alamo, we still talk about it. What's the Alamo? They go to the Lost Battalion. Oh, they're the Lost Battalion. They're the Lost Battalion, okay. But if I am in the middle of a war, right, and I'm trying to prove that I'm winning, am I going to be talking about it, a whole battalion that is murdered? No. And was it just a little bit of a a loss? No, it was, no, it was pretty devastating, right? These men were obviously greatly outnumbered. They were outmanned and outgunned, right? So, but to where the Alamo was able to inspire like patriotism and let's fight, this would not do that, right? This would be demoralizing to the Vietnamese people, right? You, we've just lost all these people. So it says, though numerous souls of ghosts and devils were born in that deadly defeat. Why do you think he includes ghosts and devils? He goes some souls in that back vengeful. They could be vengeful. They could be angry, right? If if you died in this manner and nobody ever remembers you, how would you feel? Angry. You have given up your life for your country, but nobody's gonna remember you. They don't even talk about you anymore. Betrayed. Yeah, betrayed, angry, right? It's a deadly defeat. And they're wandering, they're drifting along, refusing to depart to the other world. So it's not that they can't go to the other world. They're not, they don't want to, right? So they're refusing. They are purposely staying. Why might they purposely be staying? Huh? To haunt? That's why I've got the closest to me. Because 
the supports of the screaming soul. So now we have a hint as to why it's called the screaming souls. So do you see also a sense of supernatural in him? Yes. Right? Because he's not he's not even saying this like it's something strange, right? Oh, there's some ghosts and devils in the jungle. Okay. All right. All right. So what is the tone the author has? Yeah. He doesn't have no emotion. Yeah. Emotionless, right? Yes. Again, it's very distant. It's very distant. I'm just telling you how it is, but I'm using very figurative language and imagery, and I'm bringing you into the battle, right? So it's kind of like, this is what happened. So what kind of mood does that create for you? What emotions does that inspire? He doesn't feel. No, for you. How do you feel? Sad. Huh? Hopeless. Hopeless? Especially when he's talking about the battle, right? Did they even have a chance? No, confused. No, right? They didn't have a chance. It's hopeless. They had, they were out man. Okay. It also kind of creates a sense of, would you say, reflection, right? What was the point? They went through all of this, and nobody even remembers them, right? So it's almost kind of a what's the point? But obviously somebody does remember them, right? Who remembers them? Kind, the narrator, and kind remember these men, right? So this this kind of gives you an idea of what kind has gone through. Now, think about kind himself, the character. What do you think about him? Knowing that he's gone through this and now he's going around picking up the bodies from this battle. I don't have no opinion on him. He doesn't have any emotion. He doesn't have any emotion. But why might he be that way? Because he's trying to push it aside. Push it aside, right? That's a lot to try to deal with, right? His commander commits suicide. He loses his entire battalion. And he'll, oh, by the way, several years later, go back to that place and pick up all their bodies. Mm. Right? So he obviously has to have a disconnect, right? So any question? Yeah. No. Huh? Yeah. Kind? Does yeah. he have a brother? No. But you do find out, don't, okay. Just like I warned you guys with Kiowa, don't be getting attached to anybody in this book. Why yeah. did they die? I couldn't tell after they told Okay, but, so this is for this. Make sure that you finish the uh, Nearpod by Friday. You do need to do the summary by tonight. <laughs> You also need to make sure to read all 18 pages by Thursday because on Thursday, I want to have a conversation with you about the conversation Kind has with the driver. Okay? It's a very important conversation that he has, and I really want to get into it and discuss it piece by piece. All right? Any questions? Yeah. All right.